morning. Good morning. Welcome, a special welcome to everybody that is attending our service this morning. It's lovely to be physically back in church. The watchword for the ninth Sunday of the Trinity is Luke chapter 12, verse 48. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from those who have been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Just a few announcements. Um, on the crossbeams you will see that the um, provisional date for the meat making for our bazaar is the end of the month. The final date will be announced within this next week. Um, so there's a possibility of just maybe a, a week's change or whatever, but that will be discussed and it will be announced within this next week. Also, for those of, the, of you that don't know, Althea is a way lucky lady, managed to get to New Zealand to go and see her mm -hmm. album, managed to get to Netherlands, sorry, not New Zealand, I wish I was in New Zealand by my kids, but yeah, the Netherlands to go and visit their new grandchild. And so she'll be, she'll be away until the 13th of September. So the office will be manned by Ginny every Tuesday and th every Tuesday whole day and Thursday, no, just Thursday, Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning and Thursday morning. There will be somebody in the, uh, Ginny will be in the office. And then um, just two other announcements, if we can please keep the Zeman family, whose son Michael passed away. The funeral will be Wednesday afternoon. And also Trevor Everett that passed away, his funeral will be here on Tuesday afternoon. If you can please keep those families in our prayers, please. Thank you. And now let us celebrate the Sunday service in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As Leanne said, wonderful to be back here at the church, and with grateful hearts, let us now turn towards our Heavenly Father, and together pray with words from Psalm 63. Please stand up, and we'll say the whole psalm together. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you, in a dry and parched land where there's no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my wife will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night, because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Amen.
come before you now and pray. Touch our hearts and our souls with your word of truth. Fill us with your life-giving spirit. And let us feel your presence as we are gathered here today in your holy name. We pray be with the Miller family and bless them as we bring little McKenna today before you in baptism. As we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
family and the godparents, please do come forward. Bring Kenna along. Zani, what a wonderful gift this child of yours is, and how special that we may baptize McKenna here today in church. The baptism is very special because it's not just some old tradition that we like to do, but it is actually something Jesus Christ has commanded his disciples to do. That's giving us a visible sign to remember God's unconditional love and grace by for Jesus said to his disciples, as it is written in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. It's because Jesus Christ receives McKenna in baptism, we bless her now with the sign of the cross. McKenna, receive the sign of the cross. You belong to Jesus Christ, the crucified. He embraces you and blesses you just as you are, as we are reminded of by the story that we find in the Gospel according to Mark in chapter 10 where it reads as follows. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Dear parents and godparents, Jesus Christ also said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Baptism and faith thus belong together. And therefore let us now confess our faith in the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, on behalf of McKenna, with the Apostles' Creed, we stand. <coughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered and apostasied, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated again. Dear parents and godparents, we have brought McKenna to be baptized. And we thank God, the creator and keeper of all life, that he has entrusted you with this child as a sign of his loving kindness. Through Christ and in baptism, God says his unconditional yes to McKenna today. That is what is what grace is all about. God's unconditional and undeserving acceptance of the sinner of you and me and also of McKenna today. And in baptism we are reminded that God is always there for us, no matter what. That God knows us and that God loves us just as we are. And that to God's eyes everyone is wonderfully made and special. Something Psalm 139 reminds us of. 
words of which you have chosen for McKenna, a summary of what the psalm ultimately is trying to tell us. You are a child of God. You are wonderfully made, dearly loved, and precious in His sight. Special words that each one of us should take to heart. Because more often than not, we are far too hard on ourselves and on each other. Forgetting that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, our Creator. But so often we forget that. And we struggle to really believe it. And that is what the song Wonderfully Made by Ellie Halcom is all about. And I would like to share this song with you, the lyrics of the song with you now. It starts with, it's two in the morning, and I'm still awake in my bed, and I can't shake these lies that keep reading around in my head. What if I saw me the way you see me? What if I believed it was true? What if I traded the shame and self-hatred for a chance at believing you? That you knit me together in my mother's womb, and you say that I've never been hidden from you, and you say that I'm wonderfully, wonderfully made. You search me and know me, you know when I sit, when I rise. So you must know the choices I've made and the pain that I hide. What if I saw me the way that you see me? What if I believed it was true? What if I traded the shame and self-hatred for a chance at believing you? You say that I'm wonderfully, wonderfully made. And your eyes, they have seen me before I was born. And you know all the good things that you made me for. And I'm wonderfully, wonderfully made. And when I consider the heavens above, oh, what is man that you mindful of us? Still you say that we're wonderfully made, and you promise that you'll never leave us. O oh Lord, oh, that you hand me in both behind and before, and you say that I'm wonderfully, wonderfully made. Help me believe it. Help me to see me just like you see me, just like you made me. Wonderfully made. Yes, help me believe it. Help me to see me just like you see me. Just like you made me. Wonderfully made. And this is my prayer today that your little McKenna will grow up trusting and believing God's love for her. The love that God is showing her today in her baptism, where God says to her, You are my child. You are wonderfully made. Dearly loved and precious in my sight. Amen. And now, before we can run off, let's go to the baptism part. And so, you can put it on, Royce. And so, I ask you now, dear parents and godparents, do you wish to have McKenna baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit? And do you promise to bring her up in the Christian faith, so that she may get to know our awesome God, and answer, yes, with the help of God. Now it's with the help of God. Great. Let us then do so. you now in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth by water 
and the Holy Spirit and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. Dear parents and godparents, the Lord has entrusted you with McKenna, who he has received as his beloved child. For this we give thanks and rejoice with you. May God bless your family and keep McKenna in faith. And you, dear congregation, receive this child whom God has given to us as a sister in Christ. Encourage her to become active in the life and worship of this congregation and make her feel loved and accepted within the St. Crucis family. We all play a role in our children's lives, in the congregation, in the families, wherever we are. And now let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the creator of life. We thank you for McKenna, whom you have entrusted to Zani and Royce, and whom you have accepted as your child through baptism. We ask you to protect both child and parents. May McKenna grow up joyously, trusting in your goodness, and may you, Lord, assist the parents in the upbringing of McKenna. Give them strength in difficult times, and complete the good work you have begun in her today. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now may the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And as a reminder of that, that Jesus always is in McKenna's life, I want to light this candle now for you. And I encourage you to light this candle regularly on a baptismal date or whenever, just to remind her of God's love and that He's always there for her and also for you as parents. And as a remember that you also have godparents that are there to support you in the upbringing of McKenna and her faith. And especially in dark times, light this candle and remind McKenna as she grows up what it, the baptism means, that she also grows up in this faith that God has accepted her into his family as his beloved child. And here's the certificate. You are my child. You are wonderfully made, dearly loved, and precious in my sight. You may now be seated and relax. <laughs> And we'll sing now the next table. <clears throat>
Let us now turn towards God in a moment of silence and pray that God may fill us with His Holy Spirit, that He may open our hearts and ears for His Word. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Dear congregation, we all are familiar with words of wisdom such as these. Don't eat too many sweets. Brush your teeth regularly. Get enough sleep. Don't watch too much TV. Eat your veggies. Say thank you. Exercise regularly. Don't smoke. Talk about the things that bother you and be grateful for what you have. And I could go on and on and on because there are so many simple words of wisdom. Yet as I know from personal experience, we often do not put them into practice and we ignore them, even though we know that they are true and good for us. And so today, as I prepared for this sermon, I asked myself, what about Jesus' words of wisdom? Challenging words that sometimes make me shudder because they are so unbelievably hard to grasp and do. Words such as these. Love your enemies. Or do not judge so that you may not be judged. Or do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Or if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Or do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Or do not worry about tomorrow or what you will eat or wear. Instead, trust God who knows what you need. Yes, dear congregation, what do we do with these kind of words of wisdom? Well, I tell you the truth. What I usually do, more often than not, I also simply ignore them. Or I try to relativize them, telling myself that Jesus didn't really mean it like that. I mean seriously. You can't always just turn the other cheek. That will only lead to chaos and total anarchy. And isn't it already difficult enough to love your neighbor who loves using his leaf blower on a Saturday morning at 7? And now you expect me to love my enemy? The people that hurt me or my family. Come on, Jesus, get real. Who can do that? And also, anyone who is in his right mind knows that he or she has to store up, if in any way possible, at least some treasures here on earth, even if it's only for the sake of a pension that will keep you off the street when you reach old age. And surely, Jesus, you don't really want us to tear our eyes out. Every time we look at someone, a beautiful woman, or a handsome dude with a bit of desire, that is just crazy. That would just leave most of us half blind. <laughs> and yes, Jesus, I know it's not good for me to worry about food or money or a roof over my head or all the other million things I constantly worry about, but that is just who I am. I want to trust God completely, place my whole life at His hands, but more often than not, I just don't get it right. So please, Jesus, don't expect me to do the impossible. In some aspects of life, just leave me be, and we'll get along just fine. And by the way, is that not what grace is all about? Accepting us for who we are, in spite of our shortcomings, our weak faith, and 
and our lack of commitment towards you. That is how I often deal with the harsher words spoken by Jesus. But is that really the response that Jesus was hoping for? The response he was hoping for from his disciples, his followers, after sharing these extra extraordinary and challenging words of wisdom with them? No, certainly not. Because after Jesus shared these and many more incredible and life-changing words of wisdom with his followers during his Sermon on the Mount, he concluded by saying the following, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish person who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who built his house on rock. Every time I hear these words, they hit me hard. Because I realize that Jesus actually expects more of me, much more. Nowhere does he say, okay, friend, I know I've said all this, but relax, I didn't really mean it like that. Just continue living as you please, and I'm sure you'll be just fine. No, Jesus is actually calling me foolish for not putting into practice what he said. He tells me that I'm like some idiot who's building his house on sand without any proper foundation, and who is then surprised when it comes crashing down as soon as the storms of life come beating down on it. Yes, instead of hearing and doing what Jesus says, we often weasel ourselves out of it. For example, the Catholic Church has cleverly argued for a long time that these words don't apply to every Tom, Dick and Harry, like you and me, but only to those who have a special calling to live a holy life. That means only for monks and nuns who choose to withdraw from the earthly pleasures and temptations so that they can fulfill the will of God in every possible way. No idea how they got to that conclusion, considering the fact that Jesus never once said anything. God. However, even we as Protestant Christians, who no longer have monks and nuns, have also been quite good in finding excuses for not doing what Jesus said, by, as I mentioned before, smothering them under the blanket of the Pauline letters in which we find all the grace we need. Or we just put these words into the category of law, which we in any case have never truly emphasizing thus again the necessity of the gospel, the unconditional acceptance and grace through faith in Christ alone. However, if we read John's version of the scene where we realize that our faith in Christ, in its essence, has actually everything to do with identifying Jesus' words as words that give life. When we hear them and put them into practice. For John 7, we read the following. On hearing what Jesus had said, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet, there are some of you who do not believe. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And you?
Do you not want to leave Jude? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. Words spoken by someone, by Peter, who like many of us has made this experience, saying it without being proud, but rather being humbled by Jesus' words, Lord, I know, because I experience it every day, that I can never live up to your standards. Yet, I cannot let go of you. I cannot just forget what you have said, and thus I cannot and will not just go back to my old Way of love. Jesus, your words have touched me deeply, have changed my life, and even though I can never ever fully grasp them and do what you expect of me, I will never stop trying to get closer to you, closer to how you want me to be. So dear brothers and sisters, that is what faith is all about. Faith is not simply a rational decision after weighing up all the pros and cons and then deciding it is worth it or not. Or even though, no, even though taking a willful decision has something to do with it, faith in its essence primarily has to do with being deeply touched and being passionate about something that has taken hold of your inner being. Something that just won't let go of you anymore. That is what Peter had experienced. And that is why he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. I know deep inside of me, Jesus, what you are saying is true. I know that the only way out of this vicious circle of conflict, hatred and war as if any, everyone would just learn to love each other more, even if it's your arch enemy. I know the only way out of my worries that squeeze the life out of me is if I learn to trust more, trust you more. And I know that instead of storing up earthly treasures, that don't last and can never make me truly happy, I should rather store up treasures in heaven, such as love and forgiveness, hope and peace, real treasures that make life worth living for. And I know that instead of always excusing my actions that are hurtful to others and to myself, I need to take drastic measures, tear out my eye, that leads me into temptation because only in doing so will I ever be free from the things that make me a prisoner of sin. Yes, Lord, I know that the world would be a better place if we all would just love you more and our neighbor as we love ourselves. I know that is true. I know that your words are true and that it would be good for me and for everyone around me if I would put them into practice. But I also know that I will always fall short of your words and your will. Words that challenge me and even shock me at times because they are so radical, so out of this world, so damn hard to truly grasp. But even though I know that full and well, I will never give up trying. Because I know and believe that it is worth it. Because I know and believe that they are living words, life-giving words. Words that I do not and cannot forget. Thus, I will continue to live in this constant tension between trying and failing between flying and falling, between living and dying, a tension which doesn't make life any easier, but makes it worth living for, a tension that I can only endure and accept because I know and believe 
that you, Jesus, have already accepted me as I am, with my inability to always do what is good and right. And that, dear brothers and sisters, is where grace comes from. God's grace that doesn't focus on my achievements, but rather on my weak, small faith that is based on both doubt and certainty, on doing what Jesus says and on failing to put into practice his words of life. Our faith that is at the same time both built on sand and on rock. And I believe that is what living as a disciple of Jesus is all about. Constantly living in this tension where we seek to put into practice what Jesus has said. And at the same time, after failing again and again, remembering the grace of God that always gives us new hope and the strength and courage to try again and again and again. Because, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have words of eternal life. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will now sing the following hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Else. Um, you might not know it, doesn't matter. Just read the words, listen to the tune, think about Jesus' words.
thinking of all the things that are happening around us. We think about our country that is broken in so many ways. And we pray, show us a way out of all this mess. Give us strength and hope to go on and make the best of what we have. Seeking restoration, reconciliation and peace. Lord, we pray, have mercy on us. And Lord, we think of all the suffering that surrounds us. We remember those who have lost a loved one. And we especially today think of Gillian Zangerhaus and family, and the family of Trevor Elliott, and also the family of Michael Zima. Touch them, Lord, and heal their broken hearts. Give them comfort and peace in this time of sorrow and show us how we can be there for them. Lord, we pray, have mercy on us. And Lord, we pray for your church and for every one of us who are gathered in your name. Touch us, your disciples, with your words of life and give us the courage and strength to put them into practice wherever we are so that we may witness to your love and your vision for a new world in which we stand together as one, promoting life and forgiveness and acceptance and peace through the grace of God, giving new hope to the hopeless, strength to the weak, and courage to the timid and fearful, making the world a better place for all. Lord, we pray, have mercy on us. And together we come before you, and pray as you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now, now and forever. Amen. And now depart in the peace of the Lord. May the almighty and gracious God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and bless you and keep you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the first week. Thank you. 